Well, hello, friend. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of Artworks for Teachers. I'm your host, Susan Riley, and today is um, really special for me. I am introducing you to our Chief Growth Officer here at the Institute, Kevin Riley. And yes, he is my husband as well. Uh, Kevin came on board with us about 18 months ago and has done an amazing job of helping us grow our institution as well as partnering with schools and other organizations. And he was like, would like to share some tips with you in terms of how to ensure that you get the funding that you need for the, the supplies, the materials, the, the PD, whatever it is that you need in your school, how to get the funding for that. Uh, because there are so many things that are under the surface that teachers and administrators just don't know are available to you that vendors know about. So um, today he's gonna share some of his top tips for how to find that funding, what to ask for, what specific items that you're gonna need in order to get that funding approved, things that um, maybe you have not thought of, how to communicate with vendors. There's just so much richness to this episode that I think you're gonna find really, really helpful, um, particularly if you've ever wanted something, whether it's a PD experience or if it's um, a, an access to a subscription of something or whatever it might be, and you thought, oh, my school will never pay for that. This episode is for you because um, Kevin's going to knock that misconception right out of the park. So without further ado, here is Kevin Riley. All right. Hey, everybody. I am Susan Riley back again. And today I have a special guest. Um, I have Kevin Riley with me today, who is the Institute's Chief Growth Officer, and fun fact, also my husband. So, <laughs> Would have never um, guessed it. <laughs> some people actually don't. Some people I ask. Know, some don't. I know. They ask the question. So I think some people are, um, whenever they meet you as a um, in your role, they are either afraid to ask the question or they yeah. never even thought of it. Um, so <laughs> I've gotten brother and sister too before, which yeah, I don't, no, that's, I don't that's see weird. that's weird. I, I don't see that at all, but yeah, that's a little weird, but, um, regardless. So, um, in today's episode, Kevin and I wanted to hop on today to talk about how you as an educator or as a school leader, um, in your role can get what you need for your school, uh, without shelling out of pocket for it. And so because Kevin's whole job as chief growth officer is to do both partnerships with larger organizations and um, also to work for providing um, support for schools and getting what they need as a vendor. So um, he's got tons of ideas and tips and tricks and strategies to get what you need. Uh, but we know that so many of you are paying for things out of your pocket or you're afraid to ask your school or your um, your curriculum director or your coordinator or whoever it is uh, because you're afraid that they don't have the money. And so you immediately dismiss a possibility. Um, but we're here to tell you that there are hidden possibilities that you are not even aware of yet. So I'm excited for Kevin to share his unique knowledge with all of you today. So Kevin, tell everybody a little bit about what you do here at the Institute. Well, I think you, uh, you kind of wrapped it up. There's pretty much nothing I don't do um, or nothing I won't do. Um, and that's a function of how we're set up. But um, I do a lot of sales calls, do demos for schools, for teachers and for principals and superintendents. It runs the gamut depending on who's, who's submitted the inquiry. I look for grant opportunities. So whether that's public grants, private grants, ways that we can support um, schools or institutions across the country, around the world, who when help them with the funding side of it uh, through those grants or partnership opportunities. Um, I like to view all the schools that we work with as our partners. I don't. I always go into it with that way. I don't. I don't want anybody to think that we're just there to for the sale, for the dollars and the cents. Um, I truly do believe we try to partner the best that we can with those schools. So partnership opportunities, but also partnership opportunities from private industry, um, you know, whether it's, you know, Apple Music or any, any kind of the other big uh, uh, industries that are out there or companies that are out there that we can work with. 
I see everybody, he's got a ton of things under his belt right now that he's working on. And, and um, what I love about his position is that, um, first of all, it suits him really well. He, you will find in this episode, I think that he is a smooth talker, um, <laughs> but also he genuinely uh, looks for ways that a partnership makes the most sense. Um, I think, Kevin, that you have had opportunities where you've actually told schools this is not a good fit for you right now, um, where it, his heart truly is in the right place. And I think you said something really interesting that um, about grants that I don't think many educators mm -hmm. think about um, that many times with grants, when you're applying for them at the school or the district level, those grants require or, or are heavily weighted for schools that look for business partners mm -hmm. to help support what it is that they're trying to implement. So, um, and that's where you can kind of come in. Talk to us a little bit about that because I don't think that's something that comes to mind when teachers think about um, vendors and, and getting what they need for their schools. Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing with that is when you're looking at grants, I mean, they're grant opportunities all over the place. I mean, uh, there's a school that we're cur I'm currently working on a deal with. We're currently working on a deal with it. Um, they came and asked for a quote and they're like, Hey, I've got, we've got a business that helps us out and they provide grant money, um, uh, to support the school's initiatives or civic organizations that are out there. You know, the lions, the rotary, the Rotarians, the rotary club, the Kiwanis club, there, there are all sorts of civic organizations out there that can, will support, um, as part of their mission to put those grant opportunities out there. The only thing that I ask is when you're going after those grant opportunities or anybody who is, just shoot me an email, call me up, ask me what, how much it's going to be. Uh, Cause there's been several times that people have come back to us and be like, Hey, I got this grant money and I've got this much. What can you do for me? And we, we do the best that we can to help them out and get the best deal that we can for them um, and to support them at the best we can. But at the same time, if you just, it, it's one phone call, it's one email um, to yeah, be like, you hey. you know how much it costs right. at the top, you could have included that in your grant and right. got probably a little bit more money. Or gone in and be like, hey, I want to do a, a multi-year initiative. So like, and then that, that can kick you into other grant funding and get you all sorts of different places that you might not have thought about originally. Yeah, absolutely. So in your role, um, you've seen or you've been able to work with schools of and districts of many different sizes right like teeny tiny mm -hmm. has like 12 people in a building to districts that have thousands and thousands of teachers and um you know city school systems that are, are a little tough to navigate there's all the the wide gamut mm -hmm. so like what's one thing that you really enjoy about working with schools and one thing that's not so fun <laughs> Um, I'm going to flip that. We'll, we'll, we'll end on the positive. The, okay, the, the, the not so fun is some of the red tape. I mean, because I think, uh, you know, I talk to a school, in, especially in those larger city school districts, whatever. There's so many layers of red tape that have to get through. And despite our best intentions or our best efforts, I should say, um, to get through that up front, I always try to ask what do we need? Do we need, is there vendor paperwork? Is there, you know, this, that, the third things that we have experience with. And I, a lot of times I'll go, no, 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 it's fine. You just need this. And, and then come, you know, it's time to put the rubber on the road and they're like, oh no, we need, um, there's a laundry list of things that need to be completed before we can get our resources in the hands of teachers, which is the goal at the end of the day. And it's everybody's goal at the end of the day, I'd like to think. But there's so much there that you just got to get through. And if we'd have just known up front. So that's the that's the downside. Well, can I just pause for a second yeah. and just say that's tip number one, my friends. When you're looking for like behind the scenes tips today, tip number one is that if you are unaware of what paperwork needs to be completed in order to get a vendor approved quickly and get it and get the, the vendor paid so that they can get you the stuff. Um, if you are not aware of it, go find somebody who is. Go talk to the school secretary. Go call purchasing office. We'll often be able to guide you um, in terms of the paperwork that's needed. Some of your schools actually have it listed. Um, but do that work right up front so that you can give it all to the vendor 
as soon as possible, that vendor will then love you from here to Sunday. Because I know for our organization, the sooner you get that to us, the faster we can turn it around and the faster we can get you the product, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because uh, like I said, that that only, you know, we're waiting there. The client's waiting for the product, whether it's access to our accelerator program or whatever, and we're waiting to give it, but I, we can't do it until all the all the boxes are checked. And sometimes it's just the the way somebody in your district might be, and this might be tip number two, it's kind of, we'll call it 1A, but like whoever in your district is going to end up cutting the PA, the physical purchase order or doing the physical actual purchase, they might have the most efficient way to get from A to B. Whereas whoever I might be working with in whatever office of teaching and learning, this is whatever might be like, they might try to think the best way that they understand it, but it's not the most efficient way to get from point A to point B. So just asking those questions and knowing that stuff um, is, uh, is paramount. Yeah. Okay. And so what do you love <laughs> you, or what do you love about working with schools? Um, I guess just seeing how much, teachers and principals and administrators really light up when you start talking to really do start talking about affecting uh, student achie achievement and growth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, once, once you get into, you know, I think most of my sales calls, there's a little bit of similarities in all of them. There's that um, you know, organizational, like forming, norming, you know, storming, performing, you know, all those, all those steps of a group, you know, and we have to do it in 30 minutes. And I talk most of the time, so it's a it's a it's a compressed time frame. But you know, they start and everyone's a little maybe a little standoffish. But then we start talking about it, and then you, there's there's that moment where everyone's like, "Oh yeah, I can." Like you can almost see or feel the light bulbs go on more often than not. Um, oh yeah, I can, and then they then then you can I can see their you, anybody can see their wheels start turning and going, "Oh, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. I can do this." Uh, and then then it's off to the races. Yeah. And I think it's important for people to know that your background is not in education. Um, it's not, actually, not in the least. No, it's in construction, yeah. right? So this was a, you came on board about 18 months ago at the time of this episode um, mm. in order to help grow our company. And you have some background in sales, not any yeah. formal training, but you've had some background in sales. Um, but in beyond that, you were in the industry of construction. So for you, I think what was powerful about your statement was to to walk into this new industry. And by the way, those of you who are considering a career change, <laughs> this is like, <laughs> you want to talk about a huge jump. And I know many of you are like, what's out there outside of education, right? Well, he did the flip, right? So he came from construction into education, uh, which is totally new beast. And if he can do it, I promise you, <laughs> y'all can do it <laughs> if that's where you're headed. Um, but <laughs> regardless, I think what's um, what's great about what you just shared is that people who are outside of education who come in and see the passion, see why we do what we do. Um, I, I love that. I, I think it's so meaningful. And it also goes back to um, why we got into the, the job in the first place, right? Um, which was great. So um, this episode is all about how to get teachers and schools what they need, right? Um, in terms of working with vendors. So um, what are some of your very best tips? I think we've shared one and one A, right? But what are your best tips or things to keep in mind when working with vendors? Um, communication's key. Uh, that's, you know, the, I'm out here trying to, you know, obviously I'm, we're selling a product that uh, that's, you know, let's, let's not lose sight of that, but it, I, I'm doing a job, but if you let me know where you're coming from, what you, like, if you're, Hey, I'm looking at these other things. Okay, cool. I, I'm not, I'm, and again, this is me personally. I'm not going to get offended. I have fairly broad shoulders. And as you just said, I come from a much um, rougher industry than than education, and I'm not going to get my feelings hurt. Uh, that, that's that's me, and I think that goes for a majority of vendors. Though, like we're just we're just doing a job. Um, we're we're trying to get you the best deal that we possibly can. So, in order for help facilitating me and doing that, if you let me know as much as you can, 
so I can do the best job that I can and communicate that effectively and get you the best deal that I can. Um, that's, that's one of the major things. Um, can I just pause because you just said that so nicely, but I, this is a behind the scenes episode. Oh, no. So I'm just going to say that there are moments that there are days and, and Kevin and I work in different places. We don't work in the same office space. Um, that would drive us both crazy. Um, I think so there are days when I'm in my office and he will walk in and he will be like, I just wish they would say no. <laughs> <laughs> and what he means by that is that there's like there are moments where, you know, it's the he, he's put out a quote or said or said something um, and has been in communication with people. And then they're like they're non communicative anymore it's like ghosting right it's like yep. it's like the, that's exactly what it is that's the like definition dating of right it, it's like dating and suddenly somebody ghosts you right and all you want is for them to say hey, thanks but no thanks yeah. <laughs> right? right and you never get the satisfaction i feel like that's what happens with him sometimes he's like so if they don't if they're no longer able to move forward for whatever reason if it just wasn't the right fit or not the right time or or we ran out of money or whatever it is it doesn't matter i think you just so want people to just to just say that yeah. and not be afraid of hurting your feelings or disappointing you in some way i think like, because then that's something that you and I talk about a lot. You're like, I don't understand why they don't just say no. And I'm like, because they're kind educators and they don't want to hurt your feelings. <laughs> well, and, and, I, and I also know that the, you know, sales, you know, put it in air quote, the sales guy, it, it, it evokes so much like insurance salesy, used car sales guy. Not there's never anything gonna... wrong with insurance no, sales no, 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 no. car sales the, people. The, the, the stereotypical, <laughs> I'm the, you know, the, yes. the, you know, the stereotypical that, you know, you're like, they're just going to keep hounding you. And uh, in, in full honesty, there are vendors out there that that's, that's their sales tactic. Oh and, my gosh. I, I remember mean, I ran into one last week. That yeah. I, like he kept ha he he hounded me on email and then he followed me on LinkedIn and then he sent me a LinkedIn message and then he sent me two emails that said you need to schedule an appointment and I'm like I need to do nothing <laughs> right <I'm subscribed. laughs> right right and 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 no and this is a, a common phrase that we use all the time but just between like no is a complete sentence yeah you know or you can no thank you if you you know. Like not right now, whatever, but it's the ghosting that like you, you equated it to dating. It's just like, you know, like, Hey, we've, we've got, you know, if I've done a demo, if, you know, if, if you've emailed me, you've made contact, you reach out to me and I've got you a quote. So we've gone to, you know, might've gone to dinner, maybe a movie. And then, you know, <laughs> and then like, Oh, Hey, have a nice night. And then like, I call for, you know, the second date and it's like, Nothing. <laughs> nothing. I didn't even get the satisfaction, like a door slammed in my face, nothing. <laughs> you know, it's, but I, just that, this, this, just just be like, hey, because that'll save you time. Yeah. That'll unclutter your inbox. Oh gosh, a, lot yes. of, a lot of our communication in that follow-up sequence does come via email. And then there are a couple calls in there, but it also, it'll save your, your, your administrative assistance time and your building, whatever, like, from them having to talk to me and then they were like, Oh, I don't know. Or, or, or in the worst case scenario, and I hope nobody's done this to me, but you know, I'll save whoever some time in coming up with an excuse of where you are that you can tell your secretary to tell me on the phone that, <laughs> Oh, she can't come to the phone because she's in a whatever meeting right now. And then I call back in an hour when that meeting's over and Oh, she's in another meeting. Right. <laughs> There's no, right. Um, and so I think it, it does go to your, your point about being communicative and, and sharing as much as you can um, in those talks with vendors. But also, if it's a no, let them know it's a no so that everybody can move on and nobody takes it personally. It's just it allows you to then not be hounded by anybody else and allows yeah. you to move forward and allows them to move forward. It's kind. Clear as yeah. kind, right? Um, another thing that you often mention in terms of a tip is um, is keeping mind the calendar and keeping mind yeah. timing, right? Because uh, timing for for you on one side is different than maybe timing for the vendor. For example, vendors often um, will they'll increase their pricing 
at least once a year, if not semi-annually, especially right now. And when that happens is typically at the start of the new year. So schools typically run on fiscal year, July to June. Businesses or, or vendors will often run from January to December. So when they are, when they turn the calendar year over, lots of times their pricing also increases. I know this is true for us. Mm-hmm. I know it's true for many other vendors who you're working with. So um, and when schools have budgets, lots of times schools will um, will say their budgets turn over in July, and then they'll issue a bunch of POs or they'll do a lot of calls in July and August to get things in the hands of teachers, which is great. But if you've waited until that period of time, you're probably paying more than Mm -hmm. if you were able to lock in pricing at the end of the year, you can often get a bunch of deals. Can you, can you talk to that a little bit more kind of? Yeah. I mean, and and that can, that can come in a a myriad of different ways. I mean, as, as, as private businesses, yeah, everybody wants to make the end of the year look, look great. So the more that we can, you know, more sales that we can book um, there. I was just listening to a podcast today. They're talking about the the, four, the fourth quarter cram. So the last quarter of the year, the last three months of the year, a lot of, that's when a lot of sales professionals look at what they're, what they've booked throughout the year and they've got a quota to meet or they've got a, a sales target that they want to hit. So they'll, they're going to start pushing and, and offering some pretty good deals um, that that can you know entice you to either extend your term, extend you know if you're going with this for for us specifically, if you were looking at one, maybe if you if you've got the budget money, look at three, um, you know, because you might be able to lock in for for a better rate. Um, so and then knowing when your everything turns over to, um, we're having a lot of conversations now about people have some money now uh, through different federal programs that well, I'm sure we'll get to in a moment, but like. Um, that they want to buy it now before that before that money is is gone and you have to allocate it now and and pay for it now but you know they don't want turnover till x amount to x date and again but that comes that comes right back to communication just let me like let whoever you're working with whatever vendor you're working with know that and we can make adjustments or work it into a deal that way it's not a it's not just a you know, a, a B to C transaction, it can be a B to B transaction, which can be a lot more um, complex than just a regular B to B trans or I'm sorry, a B to C transaction, like walking into Target or Walmart or wherever and just picking up something off the shelf and you're done. Yeah. And um, I'm going to can... translate that for people. B to B is business to business and B to C is business to consumer. So if you're buying a ticket for yourself to Winterfest, that's our business to you as the consumer. That's B to C. And if your school is purchasing the accelerator from us, that's B to B. So you got to the, uh, Sorry. we all know Educanese terms, the alphabet soup for Educanese. That's the alphabet soup for salespeople. So I'm yeah. just going to help y'all out. All right. So we got to move on because we're, we're running a little bit late today. That's okay. Um, so what's available to schools and teachers right now that they, not be, may, that they may not be aware of in terms of funding? I think this is a big one. Yeah. So um, right now, so I'll I'll hit the the three major ones and three all there all the time that are always there, and then I'll hit the last one, which has got a uh, end date on it. You got Title One school improvement funds. You have Title Two A uh, supporting uh, effect, um, effective instruction uh, funds, um, and then you've got Title Four A and F, which is academic enrichment. So. Everything that we do falls under those, can fall into those categories. And, and those are always. Those are always available, right? Yep. Yep. Those, those are, are there. Funds that are always available, right? So if you think that you have a PD, like you want the accelerator for PD, or mm-hmm. if you want the accelerator for uh, curriculum, you could fit that either under 2A or 4A. It would be, it would work for either one. Uh, Title One can also be used for those those items, and those are federal funds that you may not be aware of, but I guarantee you your district is, yep. and they've set aside some of that money for incidentals. This is behind the scenes in central office. He's got behind the scenes <laughs> sales. I got behind the scenes in central office, my friends. So in central office, in their budgets, they have a little incidentals pot in every category. <laughs> So for admins, for curricular people, everybody has a little incidentals pot 
for federal funding that's available every year. And so if you think that they're just going to automatically say no, or if you go to your admin and say, I want to do this, and they automatically say no, go to the curriculum coordinator at your central office, um, because that person may have some funds for you instead. But their, their federal funds are always there. Um, I promise you, when you think that the, your school doesn't have money to pay for it, yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. <laughs> Especially when it comes to, you know, affecting in the instruction of students and professional development. There's always a little extra there. Um, the other one, the big, the, I don't know, we can call it a buzzword, but ESSER funds. Yes. Um, ESSER 1, 2, and 3. So there were three rounds of ESSER funds. It's post-COVID funds. Um, ESSER 1 closed September of 22. ESSER 2 closed September of 23. So we um, we just passed, as when we're taping this, we just passed that threshold. Um, but ESSER 3 funds, ESSER 3 funds are still available and they do not have to be allocated until September 30th of 2024. So we've got almost an entire 365 days calendar to to get those allocated. Now, as of I haven't seen a recent number, but I know the last time I looked, it was April. Um, but as of April, I think 23rd, 75 percent of the uh, I forget how many billions of dollars were in SR3, but 75 percent of those dollars were not allocated yet. Yeah, um, I, saw, I saw the most recent number. It's sitting at about 49 percent. So 49% of it hasn't even, and when he says allocated friends, he just means that they haven't been like decided where that's going to go yet. Um, allocated is different than spent, yeah. right? So they have to allocate it by September of 2024. They have to spend it by January of 2025. So you, if you want something, now is the time to get it get allocated. It. <laughs> and now is the time to be looking at, you know, multiple years, because if you've got them, the money's there now, or, you know, a, a longer term, you can get a better deal, um, because you've got, you've got the money now, and you, it needs to get used up, or it will get lost. And not just for, and, and you say that for, from our perspective, but also think about consumables, like if you're oh, yeah. placing an art supply order, or a music instrument order, or if you are, you know, looking at software, um, don't just buy one year, buy multi-year if you absolutely can on your contract, um, or at least ask if it's available to lock in this year's pricing for multiple years. Um, it'll save you so much money in the long run and you're allocating funds that are sitting there not yet allocated for. <laughs> so don't do right. that. Yep. And that's, that, I'm uh, other than that, and I mentioned grant funding before, you know, yep. private, you know, always kind of, I mean, the internet's your best friend when it comes to that. Absolutely. And I do love one of the, um, you were working with a purchasing office just recently who on, on something and it, for teachers, it felt like a huge amount of money. Oh yeah. Even the coordinator, it felt like a huge amount of money. And when we're talking about a huge amount of money, we're thinking like anything in 10, like uh, in terms of over $10,000, that's a lot of money, right? Um, but the purchasing office was so funny because he was like, I can find this in like the couch cushions of our budget, people. Our budget is like $950 million. This little, you know, right. this little thing right here is change in the couch cushions. And I think that's a huge mindset shift for so many of us as educators. Um, because for us, you know, we're constantly penny pinching. We are claiming that $250 educator, you know, tax benefit every mm -hmm. February, you know, like keeping those receipts and writing it off. Um, but, and so to us, you know, when we go to purchase something or if we're looking or interested in something, we're like, oh my gosh, that's so expensive. To us, it's expensive. But if you go to your district, when you consider the funding that's available to them, what their budget is, where their funds are, are coming from, and particularly now with ESSER, um, and they have this extra funding available, for us, it's monumental. For them, it's changing the couch cushions. So yeah. don't let that stop you from trying to get your school or your district to pay for whatever it is that you do need. 
Um, okay, so my little soapbox is over. Ah, uh, time for a little fun. So oh, Lord. <laughs> giving you some tips and tricks for working with vendors. Um, I hope that that's helpful for you. And I hope that if you are considering um, any kind of work with vendors, whether it's with us, with the Accelerator or Certification or Winterfest, or with any other vendor, that these mm -hmm. tips have been helpful for you in securing, or at least shifting your mindset a little bit in being able to secure what you need without having to pay for it out of your pocket. I'm pretty passionate about that one as well. So, all right, Kevin, what yep. is it like working in this role as a uh, chief growth officer? Let's mm -hmm. start there. What's it like working here versus working in construction where you came from? Ooh, uh, it's, it, it's very different. I, I mean, I've referenced it before. It's like, uh, you know, it's a construction is a rough and tumble industry, you know, uh, there's never, you know, check. I've, I've had a, a saying of, I, I left my feeling at home. Yeah. One feeling singular. And you just, you just have to like protect yourself against what's going on. Um, this role is, um, different. I, I have to deal with different personalities all the time. They're, they're vastly different from what I'm used to and varying across the country. Cause I'm dealing with people all across the country rather than in one locale. And let's um, not forget our organization, which yes. outside of you I, is mostly female. Mostly? I mean, everybody female. Well, <laughs> yeah, our, I was say. some of our um, coaches okay, um, yeah, are, are male, yeah, but yeah. like the, our full-time employees are right. all female. So yeah. you're the only male yeah. on our staff. Right? Yeah. And when we're all together, I'm, you know, I've been told I'm too loud. I do you know, whatever. I, you know, I'm just, I'm just a loud person, you know, it's just... so for, for all of you elementary principal men out there who have all the women on their staff, he feels you. Like, I, I get yeah. you. I see you. <laughs> really. I um, see you. And okay. So now you've kind of described a little bit of the differences before. So what's it like working with me as your wife? That's, I know lots of people have that question when they ask, uh, when this they figure so, out that we work This together. is such a loaded question. Oh, it is. This can go so <laughs> many ways. Um, no, I mean, it's, it, all in all, it's great. I think, you know, we, before I made the, the, the jump and behind the scenes, we had plenty of conversations about yeah. um, how this was going to work, how we were going to work, how, you know, it's, and it's not for everybody. It's not, it's, no. it's just not, I mean, there are, there are, people who have tried and failed miserably um, <laughs> at trying to work together. And it just, yeah. it, you know, I think we set boundaries and that that's when we try to maintain those boundaries and we work in different spaces um, so that we're not, you know, constantly on top of one another and just being around. Um, but it's great because I get to see you more during the day than I ever used to. Um, but also I get to experience things that I only heard about ever before. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I'd come home, you'd be like, oh, I did this, I did, and I'm like, okay, I, you know, but I acknowledge it. Now I get to see it. Um, you know, I get to see the, the, the excitement and the passion and that you bring to what you do, that you, what you create and, and how you create it, which um, is, you know, mind boggling to me because I couldn't do half, <laughs> maybe, maybe even a quarter of all the things that you create and the, the tech side of our business that you know, you, you've put countless hours of, you know, during the day, at night, weekends, holidays <laughs> into it's, you know, it's, it's truly amazing. Thank you. Well, and I do think what you mentioned was um, so key is the boundary paint, the boundary piece. Mm -hmm. And to be really honest, I mean, and this is partially a behind the scenes episode, so we'll go there. Like our employees were, we were, we were upfront and honest with them way before mm -hmm. you ever came on board. We were very open about this is what we're considering. And this is a move and that we want to make in terms of, um, you know, being able to grow as an organization and our employees had a lot of thoughts, <laughs> a lot of feelings on that. Mm -hmm. um, some of them have been, you know, some of those feelings that were really great and they've, and it's been really supportive. And some of them have been, it's been a challenge as it is, yeah. as it always would be yeah. to bring a new person on board. But especially when you bring the boss's husband on board, right? How do you navigate that 
And so we've had to learn some things along the way in terms of role boundaries, as well as physical space boundaries. Um, and uh, who does what, who answers what, where it kind of goes. That has been a little, that's, that's been a little, not tricky, but it's been a learning experience for us um, yeah. as to how that works. I think it's different when a company starts with their founders together as, as yeah. husband and wife versus having a, a spouse come on midway through. So, um, so we've, we've navigated that. We're still navigating some of that. Um, but also learning about each other and learning about how each other works and understanding, you know, some we're onions people, right? We continue to unfold and layers come up. Like, you know, I never knew that about you. I never knew that you like to work this way versus the way that I like to work. Um, and so that has been really interesting for me as a spouse to learn about my spouse, but also in my role as CEO to learn that about my employee. Um, so that's that's been just a, a little behind the scenes in terms of how that works. I, I will say um, one of the one of the concerns that our team had was, you know, what happens if the, at the end of the day you go home and then you have pillow talk about us our, as in our roles at night? And I'm like, people. You give me way too much credit. I'm falling asleep on the couch at like 7 p.m. There's no talk going on. Come on. No, but, but we we also uh, are my, very, very mindful of respecting some of those things from our employees. Yeah. And we also, we set times that we just don't talk about work. Like we get yeah. to dinner and, you know, Emma's home and she's been away at school all day. And we just, it could be even a really rough day or something unexpected pops up, but you know, at dinner time, we're, we're done. We're closed. We're not talking about uh, business. When we go on vacation, we really make it a point to not talk about business at all. Um, which, so which can be tricky. It totally can. I and mean, we touch ourselves, right? Yeah, like, we, do. we do. And it's funny I mean, because I often have to remind you more than you have to remind me. <laughs> yeah. And some of that, I mean, heck, I mean, yeah, we all, we all got we all got one of these, right? The you know? So, yep. Yeah. So it's it can it can be tricky, but we like you said we do try to, um, or at least set aside time because yeah. obviously, being being the ownership team, it's not a hundred percent. You know, oh, unplug. It's not it's not like being an employee, and even for me, kind of changing roles behind the scenes. Even when I was an employee, I always when we went away, I would like try to set some time to at least check to just maintenance and that's but we try to unplug and we encourage our employees to you know when they do take their time off to fully unplug completely well. unplug yep absolutely all right so i hope you all enjoyed this little behind the scenes uh episode as well as got some really helpful tips from it um if people have questions about the institute's yeah. resources or questions about how to work with vendors what's the best way that they can reach out and get in touch with you kevin uh, the easiest way is email. Uh, my email is Kevin, K-E-V-I-N, at artsintegration.com, uh, or you can call. Um, my phone number is on the website, uh, so you can just go to the sales page on our website, and everything's there. I'm always happy to talk to anybody. Um, if I don't pick up when you call, that means I'm probably in a sales call with somebody else, so uh, just leave a message or just drop me, like I said, drop me an email. It's probably the quickest way to I'll see it and then I'll, I'll respond with whatever you need. Great. And uh, for today, we are going to have that tip sheet that uh, with all of the helpful information that Kevin shared about working with vendors, we're going to have that available um, as the free downloadable. So make sure that you head over to art to artsintegration.com forward slash artworks for today's episode so that you can download that freebie as well. Thank you so much for joining me today, Kevin. You're quite welcome. <laughs>